13. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse, uh, beginning with verse 10. We have an altar of which they have no right to eat who serve the tabernacle. <clears throat> for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for the sin are burned outside the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Uh, let us go forth therefore unto him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Particularly this verse says, we have an altar of which they have no right to eat who serve the tabernacle. And there are two things to notice. One is the altar, and the other one is the eating. <clears throat> and let's face it, many Christians acknowledge the cross, um, and... They, uh, they understand that Jesus died for them 2,000 years ago, and they understand that um, they're supposedly not going to go to hell, but go to heaven and this sort of thing. But all of that relates to what Jesus did for, the, for them and has nothing to do with us except in terms of whatever benefit that we're going to derive from that. <clears throat> in other words... There's an altar, Jesus, and we understand that the altar was a shadow of the cross. It was a picture. The true is the cross. And so they understand the altar. They understand the cross. And they know that Jesus died for them. But really and truly, it, it's, there's no effect in their life except in terms of maybe in the future they won't burn in hell or they you know, won't be punished at that time or something like that. But... <clears throat> um, But Jesus didn't just die. He died through, uh, it says uh, here in these scriptures even, that he, through the eternal spirit that he gave himself. And the eternal spirit is the spirit and nature of God the way that he is eternally. The, so you can call it the lamb spirit. You can never use that term again and never mention the lamb and still say that God is self-giving in his nature. <laughs> However you want to, you know, the terminology is not really the important thing as much as to understand that the eternal spirit is a self-giving spirit and that's what he gave it through. And so the spirit that gave itself for others is the same spirit <clears throat> that we're supposed to um, eat of and partake of and have that life within us. And this is why Jesus spoke of the bread in the manner that he did. He could have used anything, but he used bread because, he, because bread represents his body and he's putting it inside of us so that we would be the body of his nature. The body of his self-giving spirit. Or, you could say it another way, that we would be the body of Christ. <laughs> it's all the same thing. Because we're not, a, we're not the body of Christ f for no reason. Just like terminology is the important thing. No, 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 no. We're the body of Christ so that he can express his self-giving nature through us. And where, where is he wanting to do that? To the outcast, to the hurting, to the needy. <clears throat> and so, um, so we see that, so believing in the altar is one thing, but then we have an altar to eat of. And we see that true believing ends up again with eating. Not just believing in an altar 2,000 years ago, but eating and partaking of that thing right now. And <clears throat> so, you know, there is this, this uh, understanding of faith in what happened a long time ago. And we dealt with this last class where we talked about Galatians 2. And verse 16 talks about his dying and believing in that a long time ago. But just four verses later is 
I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Christ liveth in me, and the life I now live in this flesh, I live by the faith that I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Christ liveth in me, and the life I now live in this flesh, I live by the faith that I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I... You ever sang a song that you never could find an ending to it? You know, just keeps going. <clears throat> that verse, if you fully comprehend it right, will just keep you in the eternal circle of that reality, that <clears throat> the, the purpose for, for crucifying us wasn't all just about sin, it wasn't all just about being bad, it was that God wanted to impart his life and nature, which is eternal. No matter how good you are, you'll never be Jesus. It'll either have to be Jesus or it'll be you at your best or at your worst, but it's not Christ. <clears throat> well, through the sacrifices we see, uh, you know, it's, it's just all in how you view this thing. I mean, you can, you can be a priest back then, and you can watch these people come, thousands, uh, you know, a million people in Israel, three million, ten million, and you can see that every time one of them fails or something, they come up to the altar <clears throat> and they give a lamb. And then you take them through the whole thing. And when it's over, okay, you know, you're good and whatever. And what you can see from that is you can do like most nominal Christians and just see that it's all about getting your sin forgiven. <clears throat> but the greater reality would be that a priest all of a sudden recognized, you know what? I think what God really wants is not them at all. He wants this lamb because that's what he keeps asking for. <laughs> you know, I mean, one is to see, you know, God is a forgiving God, and he is. But the other one is to see what he really wants. And his prescribed choice is this lamb. That, and see, I mean, it could have been you know, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, or the, or the miracle work in Jesus or something. But it's always a lamb that dies. And, and what? Gives itself for somebody who really doesn't deserve it. You know? And how many here did, did you comprehend that Jesus gave himself for you when you didn't deserve it? <clears throat> how, can, how is it that we can comprehend that? And then turn around and condemn our brothers and sisters when they don't deserve it. You remember the parable Jesus told about the guy, you know, I mean, I won't go into it, but I mean, he told parables along this line to awaken us to the fact that we're putting demands on people, you know, that, you know, we're, we're, we're cashing checks that, that, you know, we're writing checks that we can't cash, you know, and we're putting demands on people that we can't do that we can't live up to God's standard. But God does want Christ. And we'll never live up to that standard, but he will live up to it. But we've got to let him be the life of the believer. We've got to eat from this altar, not just believe in this altar. We have an altar to eat of that they don't even know about. They're not, they don't even have a comprehension of eating it it's all a comprehension of death, and if you reject the death of Jesus, then you're going to hell and everything. Folks, for years and years and years and years, I rejected the death of Jesus. I rejected the cross. I rejected the Lord. You know? And when I finally turned, Jesus didn't go, do you know how many times I called you? Do you know how many times, you know, and you turned your back on me? My God, get out of here. You know, he doesn't do that. <clears throat> He, he is long-suffering. And he is patient. And all of that is not your fruit. Love and joy and peace and, peace and you know, gentleness, meekness, faith, kindness. You know, all, the, all of those things are not us, but they are meant to be in us. There's no denying they're meant to be in us. The problem comes with how we're going to bring that about. Are we going to be the old covenant saints that try to produce that when there is no hope we'll ever do it? Or are we going to be New Testament saints that have an altar to eat of that they don't even know about, that we can eat this thing 
and get it on the inside of us. And Christ can live this way through us. And all of the attributes that God is calling for come by Christ and Christ alone, come by the, by the life and the spirit and the nature of God within us so that he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. You know, and when you recognize that, there's nothing to boast in. There's nothing to look down. You know, uh, <clears throat> somebody gets hard-headed or resistant. <sighs> My God, I've been hard-headed and resistant. I have been, and so it's like, how can I condemn that when I'm, I've, either I am the same way or I've acted the same way? You know? I mean, have some mercy. Blessed are the merciful. And what, what is the blessing end in? You shall obtain mercy. But we're so quick to just mark them off. Well, here's the deal. Well, if you don't believe like me, then you're just, well, you know, that's ridiculous. If you don't believe like me or you or anyone else, no two people on the planet believe everything just alike. Did you know that? No two people believe everything just alike. So no one has a right to say, if you don't believe exactly the way I do, then you're just marked off. It's ridiculous, you know. Besides, we, when we'd say it like that, we've made it a personal issue. It's no longer about them and Jesus. It's about us and Jesus. It's about what we know. It's about our pride. It's about how people will relate. But, and will they not acknowledge that I am a great man, a great woman of God, and that I know a whole lot, and that you should bow down and honor me when you hear the sound of the sack button, the dulcimer fall down and worship me? You know, no, I'm sorry. If you're really, a, if you remember Matthew, we talked about Levi last class. If you are a true communion priest, the only trail you have of Matthew's life is that book that points to Jesus and feed, not just points, feeds people to Jesus. John, they said of John, who are you? I'm nothing, I'm nobody. I'm the voice of one. I'm just telling you about the one. That's what it's about. And so you're not trying to become something. You're not trying to become, you know, Jesus made himself of no reputation. Do you agree? Amen. He made himself of no reputation. Okay. But what does it say just before it states that? Let this mind be in you. It doesn't say, you know, we're all working to have a reputation and stuff. And, and I'll tell you what, if you work to have a reputation... The harder you work, the more enemies you're going to have, and then they're going to tear your reputation down. So how do you know these deep things? Because I've failed in them. I mean, you know, I'd like to say I've been on the mountain, I heard from God. <laughs> but in reality, I've, I've made the same mistakes every human makes. And I've, and I've come to realize the only reputation that counts is the one the Father has of you. Whatever he thinks of you is the only thing that matters. And everyone else can hate you and believe the worst things about you. The question is, what does the Father think? And I'll tell you what the Father thinks. He's going to be happy if he sees Jesus. He's going to be satisfied if he sees more of Jesus and less of me. That'll, that's really, you know, because we say, well... They'll, you know, it's kind of like this. Everybody hates me and accuses me of everything. Only the Father likes me. No, he doesn't. <laughs> no, he took you to the cross. You know? I mean, you know, we, we'll hold on to anything. Can you see Adam holding on to that? You know, oh, well, at least the Father likes me. And the Father's clapping your hand trying to make you let go. No, I don't. And you know what I mean. He... he <laughs> He didn't bring about the cross to make you the joy of the whole earth. <clears throat> you know. He brought about the cross to remedy the world of yuck. What was the yuck? I am crucified with Christ. I'm what needed to die. You know, he didn't, did you ever notice he didn't crucify the devil? 
Why didn't he crucify the devil? The devil's worse than me. The devil's worse. See, there you go. <clears throat> you know, brother, you stay here three or four years, I'll make at least five good points before I'm over with it. <laughs> Well, I'd like to say that I thought of it myself, but I have no reputation. It's, it's all God, freely I receive, do with that as you will. But, it, but I mean, it's the truth. I mean, I remember coming to that. I, I, you know what? I, I'll admit, this one didn't come to me from the Holy Spirit. This came to one of my teachers when I was in Bible school, and we were in Romans 7, and he said, oh, wretched man that I am, and when I do good, I didn't. He said, and he said, did you know that Romans 7 never mentions the devil? And that blew my mind because I blamed everything on the devil. And it's like, it's not even mention him here. In fact, I'm the problem. I'm the problem. That's why I'm crucified with Christ. And why? Because when that old nature is crucified and Christ is put within us, then you've rendered the devil inoperative. He's, he can't work through Jesus. And Christ is your life. He's, he's, he's done. That's why the answer is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's not, it's not getting rid of the devil and then, you know, and then putting us in a utopia so that nothing ever shows how really evil and prideful and selfish I am. You know, make heaven so utopian and the devil so far gone that, you know, I will look really good when I'm still a self-centered, yucky person, but I won't manifest it because everything's going so smooth to my flesh. That's what most people think heaven is. That's their view of heaven. Heaven is going to be when God puts me in a place that I'll, no one will ever see how yucky I am. That'll be heaven. It's, to them, it's not, you know, when how yucky I am is crucified, dead, buried, and gone forever. That's heaven. And that would be wherever the Lord is, <clears throat> wherever the Lord is your life, wherever there's always hope in every circumstance as long as we can acknowledge the cross the way he acknowledges it and to embrace it the way Jesus embraced it and to, and to, want, to want the cross more than you want anything else. And I realized, when I was in Bible school too, I, I realized there's a lot of teaching going on about the cross, but, but a lot of my fellow students and stuff, I watched them, I watched their lifestyle and stuff, and, and they seemed to say they wanted the Lord, <clears throat> but there, there was just a lack of that fervor and going after the Lord. And, and uh, you know, I mean, and I'm not trying to lift me up here, I'm just trying to give one man's experience. I don't have everybody else's experience, so I can only give you a few of mine. But they, they made a rule where it was lights out at 10 o'clock in the dorm. Lights out at 10 o'clock. I was an adult. <laughs> Had to be in your bed, in your dorm, and lights out at 10 o'clock. And so they put me in a corner room. At first I wasn't there, and they eventually put me in a corner room, which was wonderful because I was able to open my window and open the screen out and literally hung halfway from my bed, halfway out, and there was a street light right there, and I could search the scriptures up till midnight or one if I wanted to, and did, you know. And I remember some of the, you know, some of the students that were doing final things and stuff, they'd stop by and we'd get to share in Jesus, and we'd get to fellowship and pouring out the word and pouring out the life and everything. And, and uh, then I'd go, gosh, you know, I'm just trying to spend time with the Lord, and everybody keeps stopping by and wanting to share and everything. And I, you know, y'all get out of here, leave me alone. I, I never said that, but I thought it in my heart, you know. I just want Jesus. Ben and I were talking about this the other day, and, I, and the Lord said, look, if you'll pour out your life for others, then if you get five minutes in the Word, I will make that more real than, than five hours in the word I will bring to life and I will feed you me but you're gonna have to quit fighting for time to get me because that's a selfish thing and you know I, you know in my mind up to that point it wasn't selfish it was the, this is all for God I hate these people I'm trying to get to Jesus what <laughs> anybody catch anything wrong in that statement 
I hate these people. I'm trying to get to Jesus. And, and I hate all the distractions. And I hate, you know, and, and it's, it was like this. Every time I finally get a little time and trying to get in the word, something always happens. It's like the whole world is against me getting to Jesus. And so I would get bitter and upset, and they'd come and they'd say, well, we need a few volunteers to come, you know, work in the kitchen right now or something like that. I've only got 30 minutes. Please let me get in the Word. I just want Jesus. I want to see Jesus. So, of course, I would do it, but then I'd do it begrudgingly. <clears throat> My spirit was wrong. And that's when the Lord said, Look, you serve me, you serve my people, you lay down your life, you pour out your life. I'll, I'll pour my life into you. I will open the word. I will open your understanding of me, and I'll do it in amazing times and moments. And boy, has he ever kept that. I mean, what I shared on Sunday, I got it at the most amazing time where you never would have expected you know, the Lord to hit you between the eyes with deep revelation and stuff. But, I mean, it was just like... Oh, my God, I never saw it like that before. I never comprehended that. And it was just out of the blue and just there. It was my father continuing to fulfill his word to me. Be self-giving. Let Christ live in you in that way, and I'll take care of you. But there is, let's face it, as human beings, there's this self-protection thing. Even if it's for God, it's self-protecting it. <laughs> you know. You know, don't touch that. Don't ask me to do that. Don't, you know. And, and, and let me just finish that little part with this, and that is, you know, I am not, what I'm not saying is just go do anything anybody says all the time and just be a, a, a cleaning rag or something. I'm talking about a faith and a commitment that God has brought you to. Maybe I'm, I'm saying this. Maybe God had not brought you to this. But he brought me to it, and so I have to communicate that to you. But I am not saying that you just go do anything, anytime anybody says to do anything. I'm saying get yourself in a place that you want the cross more than anything else, and, and you see the cross in things that you normally wouldn't see the cross in. You understand what I mean? In things that, that you think is an irritation may be God presenting the cross. You know what that scripture says about angel underwear. I mean, angels unaware. <laughs> <coughs> what? <coughs> Sorry, I a little slip there. You know, you may be putting up angels unaware. Well, there's something more powerful than that. You may be denying the cross or resisting the cross when it's God answering your prayers that you're saying, I want the cross more than anything, and it's going, okay, what is, what is the cross? The cross is what crosses the grain of what you want. I mean, that's, but I mean, I'm just trying to help you to, it's what crosses the grain of all the things that your flesh wants. Well, okay, so, so when I started facing that, I went, you know what? That was the cross back there, and I totally missed it, and I missed the Lord, and I missed the cross, and I was in the flesh. You know? And then I said, I don't want to miss the Lord. I don't want to miss the cross. I don't want to, I don't want to live my life just like I'm just some guy that circ uh, my life is based on my doctrinal beliefs make me a Christian and circumstances are, are a hindrance and, you know, is, no, is nothing more than the devil trying to keep me from everything that God wants. I'll tell you the biggest thing that keeps you from what God wants, and that's you and me, our self-will. <clears throat> and I guess just on a you know closing note on that, that is even recently, very recently, the Lord has been dealing with me in a way that um, I missed the Lord uh, and I didn't enjoy the Lord in a situation that I should have really just fervently loved him and enjoyed him. Not because I was intentionally mean or wicked, but because I, until it's Christ, I am naturally prone to self and what I want. And I didn't think about what the Lord wanted. 
I thought about what I wanted, even though what I wanted was making me miserable. <laughs> and, the, and I just saw it. And just by the grace of God, by the fact that he allowed the Holy Spirit to break through my darkness for a second, I just went. And it's almost like the father, I could almost hear the father saying to the son, look, if he knows this, he'll turn immediately. He just doesn't know it. You, you, you know what I'm saying? I mean, because you want, you really do, you really do have a heart for Jesus, but we, we are violating things and not even knowing it. That's all I'm saying, you know, not intentional, not because not we're mean, not because we're, but we're just, we just tend toward self. And I just saw it and, and I felt like, I mean, because as soon as I saw it, I went, oh man, I would never do this. It's not in my heart. This is nothing like what I want. Now that I see it, I will move all into your spirit in these things but but how long did the father have to wait to even knock on my little door and open my eyes to it because I'm wandering aimlessly assuming everything's all right and that I'm with God because I'm with God in that point and that point and this one and that one and therefore you know my whole life is with God no my whole everything is not conformed to the image of Christ yet and so I just, you know, I just thank God for the Holy Spirit, the preciousness of the Holy Spirit who does um, open our eyes and, and uh, reveals the things of our heart, whether it be what's wrong or where we really do want the Lord. <clears throat> All right, let's see. <clears throat> We are justified by the altar, his death. Remember, we're talking about uh, we have an altar to, to eat of, of which they know not. We're justified by the altar, but we live by his life. That's out of Romans 6, or 5, Romans 5. That, um, well, let's just turn there real quick. <clears throat> I don't have the scripture mark, but I'm sure we can find it here. Verse 10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. All right, <clears throat> one thing you have to remember, you can't read the New Testament scriptures randomly. You have to read them as a fulfillment of the old. Do you understand that? Because it is. It wasn't, Jesus didn't just come and do stuff or say stuff or have Paul say stuff. It was, it's all a fulfillment that we've come into the real. Okay? <clears throat> so we, we tend to read these scriptures in light of a religious concept of Christianity instead of in light of how we now live the fulfillment of what that was about. And what that was about was they had an altar and they killed a sacrifice but then they also in the peace offering they ate the sacrifice and that's what this is saying for if we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the altar then that's not the end of it see uh, much more being reconciled now that now that we're justified by the altar and everything we will be saved by his life and this is talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. We're not just saved by his life up on the right hand of God, folks. That's not what he's talking about at all. His life has always been with God. His life was always up there other than 33 and a half years. You know? <clears throat> it is the life that we partake of. We are constantly, and one day I'll share out of Romans 5 what the Lord has shown me here. There's some amazing stuff right here in these scriptures. But he just, I mean, right here, just in like verse 1 to 11. <clears throat> but if we have been reconciled, reconciled is what? It is the work of a mediator. Saved by his life or eating his flesh is what? Communion. You see? And so we've come into this place now where 
we're saved constantly from our own reactions. We're saved from things that could draw us and trick us and deceive us, traps and stuff. We're saved from that because the life of Christ is not susceptible to those things. He's not drawn in by flattery or this or that. He just, he just lives under the Father, and, and by him living in you, there's so many things that you miss, you know. I mean, it would be nice if the main problems you ever had was persecution because the life that you live is Christ. And the main source of your problems wasn't susceptibilities of falling into this trap or, or, or giving in to this or doing that because you're weak or you're, you're, you're going by your flesh or somebody's using flattery or somebody's using deception and you can't see it. And so most of your problems are the result of someone who's not living Christ. You're not saved by his life. You know you're justified by the cross. You know you believe in the altar 2,000 years ago. But your life is constantly needing salvation from these things. But it only comes by his life. And I don't want to live up. I don't want to live on this earth and spend all my time tripping and stumbling over all the stumbling blocks of the natural that I, because I can't see beyond it and I can't see the source behind it. Is that God or is that the devil? Is that flesh or is that demons? Is that, you understand what I'm saying? I, I you know, I'd rather the main problems and hurts and frustrations be because it really is Christ. You know, because because darkness actually just hates light. Then it's not personal, and I can't say that I fully got there. But I tell you what, I would like that to be the case. You know, then you, then it's kingdom living. Then you're you're about the father's business. You're not trying to get the father about your business to fix your broken life because you keep falling in a ditch. Amen. There he goes, preaching that meddling type stuff, you know. But <clears throat> All right, so uh, let's see. Uh, when, when we talk about be, being justified or reconciled by the cross, we are justified by the altar but saved by his life. In the first, it was salvation for us. In the last, it was eternal life in us. And the eternal life is the very life of Christ. Again, the saving life of Christ. Anybody ever read that book? Major Ian Thomas. It has very little about the saving life of Christ being that the life of Christ came, died for our sins, and he saved us. It's all about his life within us, saving us. It's a good book. <clears throat> <clears throat> just not sure if I should keep going here <clears throat> let's uh, since we're well we're not we left John but let's go to John 6 again and we're getting close to finishing up any references here in John because we're soon to finish up this thing with, with the bread <clears throat> John 6 and verse uh, 51 Now, verse 51 is pretty long, so I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to pull out what I feel the Holy Spirit wants me to focus on. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now, do any of you ever have a tendency to get bogged down in all the things that a scripture will say? I do that, and so here's what I tend to do. I try... To, to instead of letting it all mess with me so that I don't get anything out of it, I try to focus in on what the Holy Spirit is saying. And even if something right after it makes me go, but what does that mean? I try to hear what he's saying in one part of it. If I get one part of it, I'm better than being confused by the whole scripture. And then God can add to it and open you up more and more. But So I don't just try to swallow everything whole. I chew on stuff, and I try to take smaller bites and stuff like that. And in verse 51, Jesus makes this statement. The bread that I will give is my flesh. 
remembering that the, the consecration for the priest was to eat bread. And of course, there are many examples of eating bread throughout the, the tabernacle and the offerings and stuff, the table of showbread being one. <clears throat> Jesus said, the bread that I give you is my flesh. In other words, the bread that he gave them, the bread that he gave to them in the wilderness or in the tabernacle in type and in shadow is a representation of him and his partaking of Jesus in such a way that he would live in you. The bread that I give is my flesh. I'm putting you... Okay, let's go back to the shadow. If Jesus could stand there with the priest and says, eat the bread, eat the table of showbread, eat the bread on here, he would stand there and then he would say, the bread that I give you is my flesh. I'm, I'm trying to get you to put me in you. That's, I mean, because he could have used a lot of examples. I mean, think the vine, the branches, the bread, all this stuff is putting him in you. Even the vine and branch, even though you're connected, his life is the thing that flows into you. You know, he doesn't shove the whole vine in you with all of the, you know, everything. He, he connects you to him, and then he lets the life, the same life the vine lives off of, flow into the branch. It's always... I mean, Jesus is always referring to this reality, uh, you know, and this is what he calls, at that day you will understand, you know, I in you and you in me, like a vine or to a branch, you are in me joined or one. That's you in me. Now, I in you is me in you. What is the explanation of that? Me living in you. Let's see. Well, we get, all, we get the altar. But we don't see that the bread that he's given is supposed to be his flesh. And we're supposed to be putting it on the inside of us and becoming one with him in that manner. So, let's see, I wrote, in other words, the bread that he gave them in type and shadow always represented eating and partaking of Christ in such a way that he would be in you. He would live in you. The all every shadow, every time he gave it. He said, this is shadow land. This isn't it. This isn't the real. Here's what's in my heart. He that eateth me shall live by me. So it's always, always taking the life, the nature this Jesus that is so different from us, that is so contrary to the way we are, and not copying it, not making him, that's why I said don't put a, a leash on him and walk around with the lamb all day long. Don't, cop, don't be with him and don't copy him. Put him in you. Your hope, your, the only hope of glory is Christ in you. This is what Jesus always intended for us as priests. And that's why he made us. Israel wouldn't become that. So he made the church a kingdom of priests. Meaning, you do the real thing. You'll do the real thing. You'll sit down and you won't just put the, the lamb on the altar and kill him and say, oh, thank God we're all saved. You'll do different than Israel. You'll eat it and you'll understand this is putting me in you so that I can live through you so that I can fulfill all the heart desires of the Father and you by being your very life. <clears throat> now you're my priest. Now you're living as my priest. This, he would say, this is the fulfillment. It's either hallelujah or oh me. <laughs> but guess what? This is meant to be the fulfillment. You know. And somebody says, Randy, don't you ever get discouraged because all this stuff you see in the word, you see very little of it, people living outwardly. Well, yes, the answer is yes, I do get discouraged. But if it's in the word, it's going to come to pass eventually. That's the way I look at it. I mean, I've got to keep at this thing. I've got to keep 
being a priest. I got to keep communion. I got to keep feeding communion. I got to keep giving people the bread and the wine. I got to keep doing that. How else will we come to it? It won't come to it by me just falling down in a heap and going, oh, you ain't getting it. You ain't living it. You know? That's more or less throwing a fit. It's like, if you're a priest and you're a communion priest, this is what you will do to your dying day regardless of how it looks. You know, a hundred years ago, folks, there were a lot of people that believed what we're preaching here in this little place. There were people like Watchman Nee and T. Austin Sparks and on and on and on and on. I mean, there were hundreds of people, bunches of names that you know of people that taught this. It was, it was popular, well-known, liked, loved around the world. So what do they do? Well, man, praise God, let's, com- let's commune and let's pass out the bread and talk and share. Why? Because everybody's excited. Well, that's not a right motivation for a priest. <clears throat> you know, if you were really of God, you'd have a bigger church. Well, first of all, I don't really see that in the scriptures, but second of all, I happen to be part of a really big church. I mean, I got brothers and sisters all over the world in different lands I don't even know. And they believe this and they feast on it. And I'm fellowshipping with them whether I see them face to face or not when I eat of it. You know, and that's what John said. I, I desire that you have fellowship or what's the, uh, the, another word that it's translated, same word, communion with us. For truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son. And so I've got, I, I love all my brothers and sisters. And I know that I'm a part of something really big. And you know what? I know where it's really, really big in the heart of the Father. It's really, really big in his heart. And as long as I know that that's really what's important to his heart, then that's why it's important to me. Oh, Randy, you just picked out one subject. You just made Jesus everything. I got news for you. I didn't make Jesus everything. God did. God said he's the length and the breadth and the height and the depth. You know? God's the one. He said he's the alpha and the omega. Well, if, if he is, I mean, if he is the alpha and omega, okay? So here's, that's the beginning, you know, and the end. If he is from A to Z, the alpha and omega, and everything from first to last, and it says that, then what other subject are you going to squeeze out of that? The Bible says Christ is all and in all. You know, well, you know, there's other things like, you know, evangelism. What are we going to evangelize them to? You know, I think that was one of the things with Paul that blew that man's mind. He was resisting Jesus. <clears throat> he was resisting Jesus, he was resisting Christians, and he was putting them in prison, and he was killing them everything. Because at first, they were proclaiming him as the Messiah of a little, na- have you ever seen the size of Israel, folks? It's just a little bitty place. It is not, I mean, you know, I forget how wide, but it's not very wide at all. You know, <clears throat> and he's fighting this thinking, okay, this guy is pawning himself off as a local Messiah. And then he gets saved and he goes, okay, uh, now I'm following this local Messiah until he starts seeing in the word and seeing the father's heart that this one was meant to be the alpha and the omega and the first and the last and the beginning and the end and the length and the breadth and the height and the depth. And he went, my God, this guy isn't a local Messiah. This guy's everything. He's the all in all. He fills up everything, you know? He doesn't come to take sides with the Romans or with the Jews against him. He comes to take over. He just, he's, he, in that sense, he's like leaven that just takes over the whole lump. He fills you. He increases constantly. The kingdom of God is like leaven. Put in four measures of, of meal or whatever. That pretty soon the whole lump is leaven. That's what it says. The kingdom of God is like leaven. Well, that's the government of Christ. 
the governing nature of Christ, he just starts taking over and just starts spreading. And <clears throat> Well, we're not emphasizing something that's just an offshoot. Jesus is not an offshoot. You don't balance Jesus. You don't put a, a, a fulcrum up here and, and balance Jesus over here with, you know, family values. Folks, well, you don't. He is the, he's the fullness of all this. He's, he's the fulcrum everything would be balanced on. He's the one in the center. You know, I, I forget, oh, I, we were up, yeah, I was just recently up in Washington. Somebody said something to me about that. And I said, they said, they said, man, you, you, boy, you really put the emphasis on Jesus, don't you? And I said, you know, I don't think you can go wrong by emphasizing Christ, you know? I mean, you can go wrong by emphasizing a lot of stuff. I don't think you can go wrong by having your focus on Jesus. Anyway, I probably need to stop. Um, we'll finish out this thing about the priest and the bread later on. Father, we just thank you for your, your desire to glorify your son and that he be glorified. You didn't say glorified in spiritual things. You said in all things that he would be glorified. And so may we be priests to, to feed that incredible hidden manna to all who are hungry. May we not force it on those who are not hungry because you are the bread of life. May we not force bread down people's throats, Father. Help us to not do that. But on the other hand, help us to feed the hungry and feed them Christ. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're dismissed.